Support for Lab Out Loud is provided by NSTA, the National Science Teaching Association. Find out more about what NSTA has to offer at nsta.org. You're listening to Lab Out Loud, science for the classroom and beyond. And in this episode, we're talking to a teacher who also works at NASA. And we're talking about what students need to explore the world here on Earth and beyond. We have to build curriculum as educators and as parents that says, hey, let's just tinker. Let's just get in the sandbox. At, at NASA, how are you going to be successful? By, by making mistakes, right? By finding out what can go wrong and exploring crazy ideas. So if there's not a pipeline of creativity and exploration, then we're going to have a hard time hiring for it uh, afterwards. That's up next on Lab Out Loud. But first, I'm your co-host, Dale Basler. And I'm Brian Bartell. Brian, I got I to gotta play something for you. Yes. You ready? I'm good. Can you hear that? Yeah. What, what is that, Dale? This is... It sounds like a robot fell down a well. It's the Mars rover. It's the Perseverance rover has a microphone on it, and that's it driving around now. And they're listening to all these different sounds as it drives around. So the first time they did the microphone, it was just like, yep, that's wind. Um, (laughs) But now we're literally listening to another planet now. How crazy is that? That is the epitome of Lab Out Loud, isn't it? <laughs> Remember when we did that April Fool's joke where we actually played clips from laboratory equipment in the laboratory? <laughs> yes. Uh, listeners, if you want to uh, go back and play something for April Fool's, we, we said Lab Out Loud is changing. And it was just like 20 minutes of like stir bar and clanging. and I recorded them. And that, was, like that It was kind of fun, actually. <laughs> we still have anyhow that. um so let's stay here on earth this time or or should we yeah let's listen to this this is a first acoustic recording of lasers shot on mars wow. lasers shot on mars lasers on mars that's gonna be uh, my band name <laughs> well, this episode of Lab Out Loud is not just about Mars sounds, but all the work it takes to get to Mars and um, what kind of things we can learn from that rover uh, now that it's on Mars and as it continues to be on Mars. That's right. So we were fortunate enough to be able to talk to someone who has a little bit more connection to the rovers than we do. And he's actually a teacher that works with JPL and NASA and uh, was able to share some time with us. Uh, My name is Brandon Rodriguez. I work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the Education Department. Um, I'm actually a a scientist by by training. I worked as a research chemist for for many years um, before... I had a, uh, a, a peculiar crisis of conscience and, and decided to uh, kind of step back from, from the world of industry, and I became a high school teacher. I've been uh-huh. teaching uh, chemistry and physics at the high school level for, for some time now, but uh, about five years ago, uh, I, I was contacted by a program that uh, worked out of uh, uh, the, the NASA centers, one of them being the Jet Propulsion Lab here in LA, and they said, do you want to come and kind of do both. They kind of presented an opportunity that said you, you you're going to be teaching and working with students, but also uh, still get to do some cool science. And I basically couldn't pack up my car fast enough and drive on out. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I swear, I just read something that you that you struggled with high school. In high school, you struggled with chemistry. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. It's actually, I think it was uh, perhaps just like the. Uh, the stereotypical Latin male syndrome, I, you know, like if you're challenged by something, you got to defeat it. Um, uh-huh. And yeah, it was actually, it was probably the, the most difficult subject for me in high school. Um, and I had a great, great high school chemistry teacher. I think we all have that story of that one teacher. And uh, for me, it was Mr. Ewing. And he uh-huh. kind of channeled that, uh, that kind of combativeness of like why can't i do this into into real learning and it really shaped uh shaped my my career from Mm. there sure so what was that first day going to nasa like do you remember oh my goodness (laughs) it was uh 
it was as the job that is yeah yeah it's so wild right because i look back at it and i just i laugh at myself and i don't know why more people don't make fun of me for this but i (laughs) i drove there right and like i didn't drive to an apartment first i drove from houston texas directly to nasa to show up for my first day so i'm wearing like a suit (laughs) and a tie and it's, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, I guess, mid, mid-June, mid so it was about 110 degrees out. And uh, I'm just pouring sweat from nervousness <laughs> and heat. And my boss kind of uh, goes to greet me at the at the door wearing, you know, shorts and a T-shirt. <laughs> and he's like, you got to be kidding me, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it's it's a, it's a dream, right? Like you just, yeah. you know, even though I was, I was, you know, 31 at the time, I wasn't some punk kid on his first job. Uh, it's still just like overwhelming to to be in, in that kind of place. I was uh, I had a chance for it. It was a teacher workshop years ago. I got to go to the Marshall Space Flight Center. What's mm-hmm. that place called? I don't have the full name, but I remember we went as a teacher group and we got like badges. And like I was giddy about like I have a NASA badge, you know, and it was just a temporary one, <laughs> you know. Like I can imagine you getting your like employee forms, and they say NASA, and being a science teacher, I don't know, that just uh, had to be goosebumps all day. Yeah, you you know you you walk around and you see people you recognize, right? Having never met them before, like these are people that you see on on the press releases and yeah. YouTube videos and TED talks. And now they're my coffee mates, right? I mean, that that never gets old. That that yeah. never stops being exciting. All right. So one of the reasons we want you to to join us on the show, which you are, thank you, is to talk a little bit about uh, we had we had a magnanimous kind of like event recently about something landing on Mars, you know, and uh, <laughs> that had a lot of excitement of landing perseverance on Mars. I mean. Dale and I were watching it in our offices, and uh, we know that students were kind of wrapped with attention wherever they were learning, whether it was in school or at home or or whatnot. And um, but where do we go with the rover now? Yeah, it's it's such a good question. It, like for for me, I, I asked the same question, but I think with like a slightly different intonation. Like now, it's like, well, where do we go from here? If we can do this, where do we go oh, yeah. from here? Right? Like it's we're doing we're doing the impossible. Every single time we land on Mars, right? Like I, yeah. when I, when I got to JPL, you know, curiosity had already been, been driving for several years and we kind of, as I was getting, you know, uh, adjusted to, to the, the new terrain here, people are saying like, you know, yeah, we just landed a, a nuclear powered SUV with a jetpack <laughs> on a different planet, and, right? And, like and that, provided that was crazy, some right? like of the and, telemetry and, you know, like some of the recordings and imagery, imagery of that as well. It did not escape our attention. Yeah, that we yeah, and like, and that's a landing of something on another planet. Right, right. I mean, it's just so wild. And and with perseverance over curiosity, there are so many upgrades that not only yeah did we get to kind of witness this, um, but uh, you know the the metaphor is you effectively landed in a crowded parking lot in the one empty space mm-hmm. on Mars. Right, like we didn't just pick a basin to land in. We said we want to land in this precise spot and did that from, you know, from 250 million miles away. I mean, it's just, it's insane. That's one of the big things that set uh, this rover or this landing aside from all the others, right? It it had this like self-select thing going on, right? Yeah, that's right. I think it's called a a terrain relative navigation, this this new procedure that allowed it to scan the area and say, since you can't guide me in real time, mm-hmm. I know what to look for. I will land in the best spot um, and, and execute. How come I don't have that in my car to get That's the amazing. best parking spot? <laughs> <laughs> they save that for the other planets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there was something about this landing, and I think I've watched every landing. I was in Cocoa Beach to watch um, Sojourner land in the middle of the night or something like that for a, a NASA thing. And, um, I've seen them all, but this, I needed this one. I don't know if it was the, the lockdowns and the pandemic and just the, it was, am I the only one that kind of experienced the, the emotional aspect? I I, I understand like people who work for NASA and worked on the project and all of that, their investment. But did you hear from sort of the general public or maybe your own students, um, 
that kind of emotion that there was a it, it was almost like we all needed something to rally around yeah no i think you're absolutely right um and it's it's really wild i was i was talking with a colleague of mine just recently about how unbelievable it is that all of these kids in school today there have been robots driving on mars their entire lives yeah which is which is kind of hard to swallow oh god um, yeah but but yet somehow there is still this this excitement i mean we had uh we had over a million students register to view the landing and be part of activities and live streams um boarding so, so, passes i saw yeah yeah that's right right sending their kind of their their names to mars digitized um mm-hmm. Participating in just little educational activities, kind of simulating a landing or, or a launch. Um, so schools were really involved and kids are, are really inspired. And, and yeah, I think you're, you're right. The general public, too, just kind of really could use some good news. And uh, this really yeah. provided that. Kids or school age children were involved right down to the naming of it, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's really wild. I think it's such a cool opportunity. Can you imagine that, yeah. that young kid making his resume <laughs> for for a college application saying I named a Mars rover. Um mm-hmm. so yeah, yeah, I mean students are involved in in just every everything we do. Uh I think NASA does a great job of continuing to inspire the next generation. What you know, whether they're working at NASA or not, but just being scientifically minded individuals by you know, kind of promoting that sense of wonder and and being public facing. Sure. After an event like this, a landing or a launch or something like that, do we see an uptick in these fields for student futures where these might be jobs that they are going to be looking for in, in their futures? Yeah, it, you, you definitely touched on one of the greatest problems we have in the education department, which is we are um, we are such a that that kind of impact is delayed reward. Right. So if we go into a classroom and do this event and, and you know, maybe kind of like bring in this. Um, this sense of wonder for an eighth grader, we don't know if we've really changed a life, right? Until many years later, I mean, we're, we're lucky when an intern comes in and says, oh, you know, I, you don't remember me, but uh, you know, this happened and, and it, it, you know, I've always wanted to work at NASA ever since. Um, but when you work with young kids, right, you, you just kind of hope you hope you, that you planted a seed, you hope it takes root, um, that's but, like uh, teaching any freshman. In yes. Essence. Yeah. You know, right. Yeah. I, I remember student teaching and my my co- um, cooperating teacher said, no, you don't get warm fuzzies from freshmen. They don't come until later when they're adults and yeah. tell you. And, you know, like uh, kids can't can't, you know, at some point you can't even appreciate what's happening around you yet. Right. Yeah. It, it really is a, a, like an artifact of reflection many years later. And you say, like, oh, my goodness, what a, what an amazing event that steered me this route. Sure. I think about that when we, we, we've we been seeing a lot of SpaceX launches, for instance. My son is just engaged with that, with the NASA landing of the of the rover. I mean, he's he's all interested in space at the moment, which is a very cool thing. And, you know, he's of the generation, he's in eighth grade, where um, they've been kind of promised that by the time they're adults, you know, there's going to be more opportunities for them in space mm-hmm. or in a field that, helps us get into space more uh, you know with the ultimate maybe goal of of getting a person to mars i think that that's kind of that target age right now where these are the students that might be getting there um you know when all is said and done is that is that approximately true yeah i th- i think in a lot of ways and like clearly seeing as much of space technology as we do on TV in the world of, you know, the internet and the YouTube live stream and that we can watch these like SpaceX launches. That's obviously great publicity. Um, I, I think one thing I do worry about though, is that I don't want us to over promise like one facet of everything that's happening. So you you take a look at like, I mean, SpaceX and and, uh, these, these guys are saying, oh, we're going to send people to Mars and and stuff like this. That's, that's all well and good. I have zero interest in going. That's, that's not my plan. (laughs) Um, But like, there are a million other ways to get involved in space science or NASA. I mean, earth science, right? I mean, we, we have a a pretty interesting planet here too. Um, so I, I I sometimes think that if anything, maybe we're kind of honing in on one component a little too much. Um, I want kids to know about not just careers in human space travel, but robotic 
exploration of sure. all the other planets and moons that are much more exciting than Mars, I think. Um, even oceanography here on our planet, geology here on our planet. There's so much science, and you don't have to want to be an astronaut to be part of it. Hmm. One thing I think that's good for us and good for our students is the sense of looking forward to something in the future. When we're kind of trapped in four-year news cycles, that kind of long-range thinking, because um, obviously the <laughs> this mission encompasses way more than four years um, if in you know on the piggybacks of other missions, but obviously the seed of when this started cast a long shadow back in the past and um, and again, thinking about where something might be in the future, NASA does a pretty good job of that, uh, in my opinion, of, of thinking about the long range future or I mm-hmm. guess betting on the long game. Uh, and, and that's another thing that I hope that our students garner from some of these things is that, you know, we while we have this instant gratification for a lot of things in life, um, mm-hmm. we got to work towards something that's beyond our, our lives in many ways, too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things I try to tell my students or or any high school student, a lot of them tell me, oh, you know, um, get me a job at NASA. Right. And I'm like, well, (laughs) you're a 15 year old with no work experience. Right. And uh, you're you're probably like, you know, several assignments late right now. So maybe, (laughs) you know, let's let's start there. But, uh, you know, in in, in all seriousness, get on base. Right. You just got to get on base first. You you don't have to hit the home run. Um, So. Yeah, long-term strategic thinking, I think, is so, so critical for young kids. Like, you know, it's not about what job you want quite yet, right? But, like, what is going to help you get into college? What would you like to explore in college? What will help you, you know, kind of take the next step? You know, little little piecewise bits instead of What's thinking, an example of getting on base for a student? You know, well, I mean, I hate to, like, be be old grumpy man here, but, like, my first job was Sonic Driving, Right. I, I worked oh, fast food driving. and made yeah 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 right sure. I made I made five fifteen an hour and now these kids are saying well you know I I want an internship that's going to pay me you know thousands of dollars a month and like I understand that their time is valuable of course but like do work right like understand uh, uh that you know you don't get the dream job on day one just general teamwork first yeah of all. yeah I mean and and the skills of uh you know multitasking working and going to school at the same time understanding yeah. what that means I think those are all important skills so what does NASA look into as uh employee characteristics and let's say we do get <laughs> on base and uh you want that student like maybe looking into the future what kind of characteristics and kind of background might might NASA want to need for are you looking for like, like the that? teacher perceiver questions for something NASA? like yeah, you know uh, <laughs> yeah yeah that's I mean it's that's a great question right I can tell you I mean I don't I don't handle hiring for like actual employees but I do see a lot of like internship applications so any parent or or teacher listening I'll tell you when we look at applications for interns like GPA is not important, right? I mean, above a, a certain level, like it's whatever you you know how to read books. I got it, but like, <laughs> you know, what do you do in your time, right? If you don't have extracurricular science projects, that shows me that you're not willing to pursue and to explore on your own time. Huh. Okay. So kids that have like, oh, I, I'm on the robotics team, or I took a class on coding online. That, that to me says, oh, this is initiative. This is someone who's going to be able to roll in a, in a new scenario, someone who's hungry for more. Something they're doing on their own, in essence. Yeah, yeah. If, you're, if, you're, if you tell me you, you, hey, you got straight A's and as soon as you have an A in a class, then you stop trying, mm-hmm. right? Like that's, that is actually not a good kind of indicator of how you're going to do here. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay. This is not the business of good enough, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to the rover, this particular rover, Perseverance. Um, first of all, Easter eggs. Seems like there's a bunch of Easter eggs going on with this uh, with this rover. Now, there always have been little hidden things in many missions, but some here. Can you talk about any of those? Do you have any that you can share? Yeah, it's so it's so wild. Um, you know, for those who aren't aren't familiar with like the Curiosity Wheel uh, mm-hmm. kind of kind of tale, right? Like that's that's where this started. This uh, uh, if you've noticed, there's a Morse code, Morse code in it, yeah. on the, yeah, yeah, right. And that came from being told. So the little bumps not- in the, or the little holes on the wheels, which were needed to be there. So rocks didn't get stuck, I believe. 
Well, that's that's the beauty, right? Like that's the story, right? So the original yeah. wheels said JPL in them. They actually in 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 English. In Morse code. And oh. uh, yeah, yeah, they, they 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 actually had the letters JPL on. Oh, them. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, and okay. NASA said absolutely not. You you know this is JPL is not different. It's all one NASA. We're one team. Um, and the engineers said, of course, right? You know, we're, we're team players. So much like you were alluding to, they said, well, we'll put these holes in the wheels so that every time a, a revolution is complete, we'll be able to measure the circumference and see if there's any slipping. And they said, oh, that's, that's a much better idea. Uh, and that was completely bogus. Uh, it, it, was, it was just to put JPL in Morse code. Uh, <laughs> so, so JPL has this history of kind of sneaking little things in that are uh, kind of promote our site uh, much to the uh, 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 discontentment of NASA overall. Mm-hmm. I, the it, parachute? Yes, yes. So the parachute is the perfect example, right? Uh, being able to see that in, in uh, kind of encoded uh, as it uh, uh, descended was a really cool treat. I didn't mm-hmm. actually know about that ahead of time. That was a surprise Yeah, he said, I, he, I can't remember the the person i want to say he was like he seemed like he was lead and he was going through the footage and he's like just for you just so you know there's some there's the pattern means something he was real kind of like hey by the way <laughs> yeah and then lo and behold there's things hidden in the parachute i think there's a family tree of the previous uh, robots etched on it somewhere yes that's right yeah kind of like the uh, uh the ones you see on your uh, uh on the minivan windshield yeah yeah exactly <laughs> um there's a there's another Morse code one. Um, if if you found that one um, in one of the the images uh, on on uh, on a plaque on the rover as well. Okay. Can you pick one thing that this rover? It's like the big standout. That this rover is going to do that all the other rovers couldn't come close to. Oh man, that's see now now. If, if see, my, there's no one thing because there's a couple big ones here, isn't there? Yeah. Plus, if my colleagues like hear me pick one and it's not their thing, they're gonna get really mad. <laughs> <and>, Helicopter. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously the helicopter. Let's 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 set the helicopter aside. We're going to come back to the helicopter. Did but it the rover, perseverance but the set rover the helicopter itself, aside? What <laughs> What's perseverance doing that that's never been done before? I mean, one of the things that I'm I'm excited about um is is this device called Moxie and that's maybe just the chemist in me. Um <laughs> but this this device Moxie is going to uh effectively you know, electrocatalytically produce oxygen on Mars. Oh, that's right. Uh, so it's a it's a pilot unit. It's quite small. Um, I didn't know that. But it's going to take the the thin carbon monoxide atmosphere and split it uh, to to extract the oxygen out. Um, so why? This, like well, a proof yeah, of concept thing, right? Yeah, yeah. The proof of concept right now. So hopefully it works. But you can imagine if it does, there are two potential futures for this, right? Uh, so oxygen does two important things, right? You can breathe it, but do you guys know what the other thing you can do with it? You can burn Fuel. it. Fuel? Yeah, that's right. You can burn it, right? So if it works very well, you could imagine it being part of like a habitat for future you know, human exploration. You could leave it in a 3D constructed dome, have enough oxygen when an astronaut gets there. But if nothing else, you could f- use it for fuel to send Martian samples back to Earth. Uh, so, so this is part of the Mars sample return program. What if we could burn that oxygen and effectively mail Mars rocks back to me here at home? <laughs> and this is somewhat we're starting to see real life kind of imitate science fiction because that's that's been the promise in a lot of science fiction that we've either watched or seen is that, you know, you take the raw materials of where you are and you turn it into things that we need. And, you know, like the whole idea of space mining and whatnot, that's this is basically the, the the start of that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there's there's all this talk now of, of like Artemis and going to the moon and extracting water. And these are these are not cheap tasks, right? This is not an easy thing to squish a rock hard enough to get the water out, right? No, but, no, no. <laughs> you know, all of these are kind of you know huge, huge challenges. But if you can imagine even just that first step of being able to produce air on Mars, that's one less thing you have to take with you. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Can we talk about the helicopter now? I was just going <laughs> to say the same thing. All right, Ingenuity is the first ever helicopter that will have an opportunity to try to fly on Mars. Um, was Ingenuity was that name also selected by a student? Yes, that's right. I can't recall uh, the name of the student that picked it, but yes, was also chosen by a student. 
Okay, so walk us through. It's a little helicopter. It's a little yeah, drone. Can you tell us? It's wild. I, I got to see it uh, uh, before it was loaded up. And when you say little, I mean, it is little and it is light, right? So it's just, I think it's just barely four pounds. Um, mm-hmm. The the uh, uh, propellers on it are, I mean, just, I mean, could not be more lightweight. You'd barely even notice they were on your hand. They're so Carbon light. fiber? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just, I mean, just, I, you know, they have to be. When you think about the mm-hmm. fact that there's no atmosphere there, how are you going to fly, right, without the air to kind of give you your thrust? Well, um, barely no atmosphere. Yeah, exactly, right? I mean, so, so, so little, uh, one one hundredth of what we have here. So what do you do? You make it really, really light, and you spin the crap out of it. Um, and uh, so these kind of counter-rotating blades allow you to get uh, a little bit of lift. And they tested that here on Earth by basically a chamber, um, I think. I think it was a chamber with the, mm-hmm. with the same atmosphere, and then um, countering the, the weight by just you pulling up on it, in essence, yep. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They put kind of like a, a little tether to simulate the gravity difference between Earth and Mars. Sort of like your astronauts in water kind of yep, thing. Yeah, yeah, kind of, exactly. Yeah, a little bit of buoyancy, yeah. if you will. And and it's not just out there to fly, you know, and take a picture of the lander, which I guess is what it's going to try to do, right? Or not the lander, the rover. It's going to try to take a picture of the rover and vice versa. Yes, but it's yeah. also just to, um, uh, the, its number one mission is data collection, right? Yeah, so you can imagine uh, the the first planned flight, uh, which uh, we should get some updates on just next week. Um, so we're looking at kind of selecting where and when that's going to take place. The Perseverance rover is going to kind of lock eyes, all cameras on recording, <laughs> and uh, and we'll start that test flight. And those test flights are going to be really small to start. You know, most likely just up and down. Um, and the helicopter has two cameras on it as well. And that'll give us a chance to kind of test the software, you know, does it correct? Does it, you know, if, if a gust of wind were to blow by, would, you know, would it be able to uh, kind of uh, uh, recalibrate and continue on its flight path? So it'd be very, very small baby steps first, but I mean, a very, very exciting opportunity. As someone who's flown his quadcopter straight into a tree, <laughs> um, I'm nervous. We have video <laughs> proof of this. <laughs> yes. The funny thing is it flew into a tree, got stuck in the tree and stayed in there for a year, more than a year. Oh, and then wow. a storm t- finally took the tree down and I got the drone back. <laughs> and more importantly, the SD card in it. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, I-, I was saying I'm nervous for this, <laughs> this helicopter. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I feel like the amount of excitement for this has not quite matched the the feat right uh i think more people need to be pretty amazed that there is this kind of wright brothers moment taking place on another planet um that's this- what choked me up when i saw that clip um when they were talking about ingenuity they showed the first flight thing and i saw that and i just had this overwhelming like emotion i was just like oh you know like that hit me all of a sudden when you made that parallel to the Wright brothers. And I mean, it just opens the door for much more, you know, much like every Rover has to this point, right? Like opens the door Mm -hmm. to more sophisticated exploration of Mars, being able to get that bird's eye view and having kind of a, a scout system could really open up what we look for and and how we drive around on the surface. Mm -hmm. Hmm. A few years ago, our state science um, organization had a conference and, the keynote speaker for the one of the presentations was Kobe Boykins, who's an engineer at JPL. Mm-hmm. And, Great hockey player too. Oh, is he? Okay, <laughs> yeah. he was he was wonderful, and and you know his uh, stories, uh, especially in, in the after hours, kind of like a uh, you know after the conference is done and we're all kind of uh, hanging out at the bar, uh, were just phenomenal. And but what struck me during his presentation was talking about. Mm-hmm. All of the basically his job is a lot of problems and a lot of problems to solve and using science to solve them to test it and and really that kind of spoke to me of um, how do we how do we prepare students for that world of uh, of of that basically and how do we get them you know because like you said you know it's great to have just just great grades but we want you to kind of have that 
an experimental kind of thinking. We want you to be out there trying new things in science. And and that spoke to me as what Kobe was saying was, you know, you really need that kind of a, a kind of a mindset to, to basically make things like this work on Mars is how do we get students to do that uh, now? Yeah, yeah. If you if you ever listen to a common theme of all of the great JPLers, whether it's Kobe or or my friend Bob at Ferdosi, um, they all will tell the same story, which is you have to fail. You you must get accustomed to failure. Uh, and I know both those guys give give very frequent talks, just trying to preach the value of of taking the stigma away that failure is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, when I worked in industry, uh, we would actually evaluate new projects on how fast they were to fail. It was a desirable concept to know, hey, if this is going to go badly, how soon will we know that? Mm-hmm. Cause that's less time that's going to be wasted, right? Less money invested. Um, so we have an education system, especially in K-12 that makes kids afraid of doing badly. It, they're there's they're so afraid to explore because they just oh what, what will happen to my grade or, you know will this my, will my parents get mad at me will my teacher be upset you, you we have to build curriculum as educators and as parents that says hey let's just tinker let's just get in the sandbox and like let's just blow some stuff up um, and that that kind of youthful imagination gets crushed out of kids I think in in the K twelve system. And then we ask at, at NASA, how are you going to be successful? By by making mistakes, right? By finding out what can go wrong and exploring crazy ideas. So if there's not a pipeline of creativity and exploration, then we're going to have a hard time hiring for it uh, afterwards. Like the, uh, the theme song to the famous kids cartoon DuckTales says, Making messes into successes. <laughs> Dale and I were watching that a little bit, and we were like, "Wait a second, we don't know all the words to this." And so, Dale, we and I, we went down this little rabbit hole earlier, and <laughs> that line just spoke to me perfectly. If you haven't listened, look up all the lyrics to Ducktales. They're not what I thought they were. I've been singing the wrong Ducktales for years. I I don't think I know any other word than woohoo. Like that's the only. <laughs> They well, don't always say ducktails either. That was the that was the, sh- there's the a, surprise There's a line for that me. says luck tales. Yeah, no. good, good luck tales. Good luck tales, and I'm like, what? Hmm. <laughs> this, only, see this, this really dates us to to a certain generation that's listening right now because there's kids oh, going, yeah. what? What is this ducktails? Gr- well, ducktails they brought it back on Disney Plus. You know? Yes, oh, that's yeah, true. yeah. I yeah, love yeah. the and, and This is an important yeah. task too, as just as as well rounded individuals. <laughs> go look to see what cartoons have staying power. There you yeah. go. Because like go. Thundercats now is really bad. Uh, <laughs> but Batman the Animated Series, even better than it was when I was a kid. So Thundercats oh. is bad? Was it like, is it cringy bad? Yeah, cringy. it's like the G.I. Joe style, like really heavy handed message of the day kind of thing. I loved it when I was a kid. Oh, I remember yeah, it. Yeah. Mainly because of Snarf, I think. <laughs> the Let's go back to the failure point. We've definitely heard, learn to fail, don't be afraid to fail, fail forward, all of those kinds of things. I sometimes think that mantra becomes a poster. Um, And I know that on the receiving end of someone, of a kid who's failed, students in our class, when they fail, to say get used to fail, failing hurts. Isn't it more than the failure part that we're really trying to promote here? Yeah, I, I, I think you're right to kind of challenge this point. And I think the the idea of it becoming like some kind of cheesy credo that goes up in an office is is important, right? We don't, we don't just meeting. want that. Yeah, like the like kitten on the end of the rope, hang in there. Yeah, so of, right, yeah, right, yeah. hang in there, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it's not that... It, it depends on what we define failure as, right? And again, I think that comes back to this thing. If you tell kids, be okay to fail, their first response is like, well, I can't get an F. But that's not that what I'm year. saying, right? <laughs> you know, I, don't, I don't want you to get Fs. That's, that's something else. I want you to make mistakes, be able to kind of be glad you made a mistake, and then be able to extract understanding from that, right? Um, yeah, it's really that error correction that we're, I think, pushing for, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And think about think about a child or a person you know who's clearly had this behavior where they were never corrected, they never made a mistake or felt consequence. What mm-hmm. kind of person is that as a coworker, as a friend, right? They they don't know how to evaluate, they don't know how to empathize, like they are restricted to only success. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that person to me is not someone I want to work with uh, for fear of what's going to happen when that's taken away from them. Hmm. How has working at NASA impacted how you teach? Ooh, yeah. It's, you know, uh, I mean, as I mentioned, luckily I'd been kind of in science before, but I'll admit while I loved my, my other job and they took great care of me, it was as a private sector job, it's very um, – you know, it's cash motivated, right? You have shareholders yeah. and a stock price. Uh, so you don't do it for the wonderment of science. You do it to, to pay the bills. Um, NASA has really given me context in my in my teaching because now when I, I mean, it's really hard to not get kids excited about space. Like you're really doing it wrong if you, you're mm-hmm. teaching space and they're like, oh, <laughs> lame. Oh, yeah. Um, but like the, it, it really answers the why. So, like, why do I need to know this? Like, well, just imagine, right? Um, And I think another thing that NASA does really well is that it's not just the scientists. So when you tell kids, like, oh, this is chemistry, this is important, they're like, I don't want to be a chemist. And that's that's a good point, right? You probably won't be drawing molecular orbitals anytime soon. But NASA is so much more than that because you guys are aware of what's happening at NASA thanks to writers and artists, right? Storytellers that bring it to the community. That's an important part. Do you want to be a scientific writer and communicator? Yes. Um, so, you know, it's a great example of that is that COVID model we see all over the place. Uh, an artist had to design that one, the one that CDC uses, the red one. I mean, it's everywhere, but just think mm-hmm. of the person an artist drew that to convey how it looks. Yeah, I mean, it's just it takes all types, and I, like it's the world of of NASA is so interdisciplinary, and I think that's mm-hmm. really exciting. Like, are you a great writer? Can't wait for you to work at NASA. Are you a great artist? Can't wait for you to work at NASA. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. So it's, it's it's such a bigger realm than just one field. Well, you're right because there's so many um, artist renderings that we see because we don't actually always have images, or the images that we get aren't necessarily what we would. You know that this is not necessarily the perception of what the data is telling us. So we we do need to have some, I guess, vision or some kind of like uh, visual translation, um, just from an artist that is working through NASA for us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you take a look at if you guys have ever seen the work from, of uh, of uh, Joby Harris, who's like I think my favorite artist at at NASA. He does all these like uh, travel bureau posters, the retro like oh come oh, visit like the parks. You know, Yes, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, he does those for all like the planets and exoplanets we find, and I mean, it's just you know, it means great artwork based in science, and that's that's really exciting. Oh wow, yeah, that's a and, and it, correct me if I'm wrong too, but any of the images that NASA puts out, those are copyright free, if I'm not mistaken, because yep, they're that's right. Yeah, every, everything is for you guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. even even the science itself, as taxpayers, that science is yours. Hey, we paid uh, for so, that. Yeah, all that, all that data is available. So, yeah, thanks. Well, that's another thing to convey to kids when you have these kinds of – this kind of research, you know, to really get that message that this is this is yours. Mm-hmm. So in thinking about that, uh, let's let's think about the, the rover. Obviously, we have – there's more cameras. There's more ways to collect data. There's even another vehicle, of course, to collect data. And all that's coming back to Earth. And it, are there ways that – students can interact with that data at home um are there ways that are there things that they can do with mi- uh, the the images that are coming through um besides just kind of like peering through it out of curiosity yeah the we are always trying to develop more and more ways for students to interact with the data uh, a lot of what we do in the education department is actually write lessons around the authentic data coming back from NASA missions so that kids can interact with it you know, in, in a little bit more of a meaningful way. So it's true that, yes, you could go online and you can see these pictures from Mars, uh, but what do you do with them? Um, hopefully soon, as that data comes back, we'll be able to have kind of a right lesson plans you know, for the students to be able to understand a little bit more clear what it is we're doing and how they can help. 
this this already exists in a ton of other missions, Earth science in particular, yeah. where you know all of that climate data, which is you know so critical to get kids to understand as soon as possible, because mm-hmm. um, you know spoiler alert, our Earth is on fire. So <laughs> like being able to pull where what. Um, what is happening with temperature over the last several hundred thousand years? What's happening with greenhouse gases? That data is downloadable and interactive, and they can really see for themselves. Hey, this is a, this is a truly a scientific problem uh, that that we need to address. Is there hmm. anything like uh, I'm thinking of like the folding at home kind of a deal where you know you, there's so much data that you know we can't process it all, but you can be part of this research by doing a, having your computer doing a little bit of it and getting it back to us. Is there anything yeah, they, like um, that? Sort of a crowdsource? Yeah, yeah. yeah crowdsourcing there, the data. There's, uh, uh, I think, several um, actual uh, websites like this looking, uh, I think it's all on like Zooniverse or something like that, um, looking at like, can you ID exoplanets or transit data here? Oh, you know, those, those really, really big, big data things that, AI is, you know, learning to handle, but sometimes you really just need human eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, students and, and the public can make contributions in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What did you do all summer? I identified exoplanets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put it on that application, right? That's going to look good. That's right. That's right. That's true. That's a good point. We talked about resilience uh, after making mistakes, you know, getting comfortable with making mistakes and recovering from that, you know, learning to fail. Another thing I think about when I, you know, with JPL and NASA in general is having patience doing a project that is long. Brian kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Yet we know we have our students, high school students for four years. We have a class periods that are short and defined. We have a school year that's defined. Do we provide students with enough opportunities um, to kind of go long in essence? Yeah, yeah. What what a great great point. I I think it's one of the things that I find most difficult at NASA is mm-hmm. this patience and thoroughness. I'm not a detail oriented person, right? Which means I have I have a very short career at, in science at NASA. Uh, the the idea that like I have colleagues who have been for eight years working on this rover and they come in and they test this circuit every day over and over again thousands of, yep still works still works that sounds like this kind of sisyphean task of just rolling the boulder up all day mm-hmm. sounds awful to me um but there is that just that long-term delayed reward that they they played an integral role in doing something that's never been done before um i'll i'll say that it's I, I recognize it's a valuable skill, but if it's not for certain students, it's okay. If it's yeah. not for certain people, that's fine. If you are the kind of person that needs to work in a high speed, kind of fast paced environment, there are there are jobs in STEM for you. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's true. Okay. You know, if you you know, you look at the kind of people that go uh into engineering versus go to medical school, right? A med student is a guy who says, uh, you know, in 10 years, I'm going to be paying off millions of dollars of debt, but I'm going to be doing what I love, right? Like, that's that's not me. I, I don't have that that patience. Um, but, uh-huh. you know, m- maybe you just – you can still make an impact kind of in your microcosm uh, in, in many, many jobs. There's so many – you talked about like, you know, like even climate change you talked about before. Um, like there's so many of those kinds of problems, though, that take a long time and we can't – you know, it's it's, it's, it's like a cathedral lot of things thinking, that need, you know, doing, yes, working on something yes. that, you know, will, won't won't be completed in your lifetime. It's going to take yeah. a couple generations and you're going to solve problems along the way that you don't have answers to, to the, you know, doing it right now. So maybe you're pushing that boulder up, but, you know, you're you're finding ways to push the boulder up and hand it off to others. For sure. For sure. And I mean, the, the climate example is slightly different because there's a moral conundrum. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, with, with uh, you know, if we want to ever send a um, a rover to Europa, and you got to wait five years for it to get from Earth to to you know near Jupiter, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's a patience game, right? That's a delayed reward. Um, but in terms of like actionable things that we should be doing, there are things you don't need to see the outcome to know. <laughs> I should I should probably start shipping in. Yeah, I mean, even just communicating with. Perseverance, for example, is the you know eleven minute and change delay back and forth. Uh, things things like that. Like space is not immediate. Yeah, 
Yeah, and even for that, right, you think about what you're doing each day. You know, I feel like sometimes we get maybe caught up in this kind of Instagram lifestyle of like, yeah. you know, you get the the picture or the video and you say like, oh, wow, it must be so amazing. But think about what transpired to get there. Um, so even even driving the rover around, it is not a glamorous process, right? I, I've sat in that room and you just kind of pump code in and test the code and debug it. And you say, all right, that's what the rover is going to do tomorrow. See you guys in the morning, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think the only th- there's a scene from like The Martian. I'm assuming you've seen the movie The Martian mm-hmm. or the book. And I think there's a there's a several scenes in there where the, you know the mission control is kind of empty. It's dark. It's nighttime, and there's a few people just watching a few screens. And they're you know they're that's their their job. You know it's the the big moments um, are summarized, and we think they all happen at once, but they don't. And yeah. And the only parallel, and this doesn't work great for kids either, because you know they're adolescents, they're students. Um, but like, if you look through family photos, for example, or if you were talk, talk to parents and say, you know, you can, you can kind of replay all the big moments back in your head, but the, the, what kept you going is those little moments that were going through there. The, you know, you, you cared about uh, the kid is the project, I guess, but you cared (laughs) about the mission. You cared about the mission and all those little steps in the middle of the night, half asleep kind of got you got you to where they are, but you don't have all the photos of that. That's not your Instagrammable kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really is. Everyone's going to have the ups and downs. I think the real question is where's your baseline, right? Where, where, what is the day to day average out to be? Um, Mm -hmm. and I, I definitely have some days that are good. I have a lot of days that are bad. I have a lot of days that are sitting at this computer screen for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not glamorous, but when you, when you plot the trend, um, it's such an amazing experience overall. Hmm. What can we look forward to in the coming weeks and months and, and hopefully years with Perseverance besides a, a helicopter? Yeah, certainly in the in the near term, uh, you know, looking at, at that, that helicopter landing, I think is huge. Once we start taking uh, core samples, that's when we're really going to be kind of advancing the mission in the way that's going to, um, you know, really move past curiosity, which is let's look for life. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and let's not forget that's I mean, that is the the mission here. Right. Is yeah. we, we understand the geology now. We understand the past. The question is, was there ever life there? And that's that's where where perseverance is really going to start getting exciting for me. Hmm. Hmm. What's the easiest way for students, teachers, teachers with their students to follow what's going on? With perseverance and uh, NASA in general, JPL in general too. Yeah, you know certainly, uh, you know I would tell all teachers and students to check out the JPL education website, jpl.nasa.gov/edu, and that's where mm-hmm. you're going to find all of our activities, our lessons, news written for uh, for students and for adults. Um, oh, so I mean everything is is just kind of built to take off the shelf for kids to kind of drive their own exploration or for teachers to lead their classroom. Um, really, really a nice kind of one-stop shop. We do all sorts of live streams, uh, you mm-hmm. know, Q and A's, uh, so you can participate live. Um, and it's just a, you know, a chance to speak with us and speak with subject matter experts at, at NASA. You have that for all ages. Do you have things written for even, uh, you know, like our elementary student students? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we, my team is a, a small, but mighty, and we are, um, all, we all have scientific backgrounds, but we have all also taught. I'm the high school representation. We also have middle school and elementary school representation. So we we kind of have the skills to write to that audience. Oh, great. Mm. That's awesome. Well, Brandon, thank you so much for your time. Uh, It's truly a pleasure to talk with you and uh, hear about what's happening at JPL and NASA in general and what we might expect in the future. Um, It's been an exciting ride watching Perseverance (laughs) land, and, and I really do... (laughs) <laughs> look forward to seeing you know the the enormous amounts of data and images coming back yeah thanks so much for having me guys it's been a blast thanks much brandon thanks for listening to this episode of lab out loud if you'd like to learn more about some of the things discussed in this episode or previous episodes you can find show notes at our website laboutloud.com if you have a guest idea or a future topic that you'd like to see on lab out loud go to our contact page and send us a message. Also, you can subscribe to Lab Out Loud on your favorite podcasting app, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to find podcasts. While you're there, leave us a review and rating. Your input helps others find our show. Thanks again for listening.